With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. This morning from Nehemiah 12, we're considering the question, how can I keep from singing? Now, if you had told me over a year ago that when we came to this study and, 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 and looked at the subject of singing in church, if you had told me that that would be controversial a year ago, I would have thought you were talking about stoic, quiet members of the church who, who, who maybe feel a little offended by messages like this and who want, to, who want to respond, well, pastor, I'm just not energetic, I'm just not expressive, I love the Lord, but I'm just not a singer. If you had told me a, a message on singing in church would be controversial, I would have thought you had those kinds of church members in mind. And if that's you, I'm not here to offend you at all today. But if you've been paying attention over the last 10 to 11 months in particular, there are actually city councils and state legislatures and recently a, 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 a decision by the United States Supreme Court which upheld a ban on indoor singing in church worship services. And people ask me, do, do you agree with that decision? No, I do not, but I notice that a lot of Southern Baptist church members don't need an overreaching decree from the Supreme Court to keep their mouth shut in the house of God. All they need is to just sleep a little bit later, not be quite awake enough, miss that second cup of coffee, or maybe the choir special is a little too soft, a little too fast, a little too loud, a little too slow, or it's a song that I don't know or a style that I don't prefer. And in that context, this celebration at the dedication of the walls of Jerusalem would present this question to us, how in light of everything that our God has done for us, how can I keep from singing? In this technological age, you're familiar with the idea of a default setting. Your computer or your phone has certain default settings. That's how it naturally happens. You've got to go in and change it to make it be something different. I say that to say the default setting of the people of God ought to be that when God's people gather on God's day in God's house and, and exalt God's Son, the mouths of God's people ought to be open in worship. We ought not have to try to convince you to sing and worship and praise God. That, that ought to be the natural default setting. You ought to have to come up with some reason why you can't. Pastor, I'm sick this morning. Pastor, Pastor, I, I, I've got laryngitis. Pastor, I've got a specific reason why right now I cannot sing. But otherwise, the question ought to be, how can I keep from singing and worshiping the Lord? Now, we, we've got about a half hour or so left in our uh, Bible preaching today, but I just want to give you three quick lessons today. Let's start by examining the mandate for our singing. One reason that I say the Supreme Court decision that upheld California's ban on indoor singing is because they're reaching into an area that's not theirs into which they should reach. This is really a biblical commandment. And no court in the United States of America has the freedom to tell the people of God that they cannot sing any more than they have the freedom to tell me that I cannot preach the Word of God. The issue for God's people is not what a court has said, not what a city council has said, or what a state legislature has said, but what has God said in His Word. Now, there are two things as we just kind of move thematically through this uh, second half of the chapter. Two things I want you to note with me about the mandate for singing. Number one, it is an imperative practice. The word imperative just means it's a command. It is a commanded practice from our God. In verse 46, the, the text refers to the songs of David and Asaph. That's a reference to the book of Psalms, David and Asaph. And the sons of Asaph were among the most prolific songwriters in the Jewish hymn book we have as the book of Psalms. In other words, they say we're doing this because of what the Word of God has commanded us to do. In verse 36, there's a reference to David, the man of God. Now, David, like most men, had a lot of different titles, a lot of different uh, 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 positions that he held and hats that he wore. But they do not say we're conducting this worship service based on David the king, not based on David the singer, not based on David the songwriter. We're basing our worship service, they say, on the decrees of David, the man of God. That is, we're basing it on the, on the man of God who wrote down part of the Word of God. 
You see, one reason the recent court decision banning singing has been a controversial issue of religious liberty is because the government does not have a right to, 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 to tell you you can sing or to tell you that you cannot sing. God has not even given us, watch this, God has not even given us the right to sing as much as He has given His redeemed people the responsibility and the commandment of God to open our mouth and praise Him. In verse 21, we read, or in these 21 verses, there are at least 21 references to song and singing and singers and choirs and musical instruments. That's really a microcosm of the Bible. In fact, in the Word of God, the word sing appears 169 times. The word sang, uh, 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 well, she sang today, didn't she? That, that word appears 11 times. The word song appears 61 times, and singing appears 25 times. Notice a few verses we're going to put up on the screen. In Psalm 100 and verse 2, the Bible says in the imperative, serve the Lord with gladness and come before His presence with singing. You say, well, I don't really like to sing. God didn't ask you whether or not you like to sing. Ephesians 5, 19, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody, that word for making melody literally refers to the plucking of the strings of a musical instrument. So you do have, with apologies to some uh, pseudo-Christian denominations, you do have instrumental worship mandated in the New Testament. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. First Chronicles 16.9, here's a mandate from God. Sing to Him. Sing a psalm of praise to Him and tell of His wondrous works. How about Psalm 13, verse 6? I will sing to the Lord, and here's why. He has dealt bountifully with me. Has God dealt bountifully with anybody in this room this morning? Then the Bible commands us, if God has dealt bountifully with you, one of the most natural effects and overflows of that is you ought to open up your mouth and give praise to God with a song of worship. By the way, did you know you're being like Jesus when you sing? You want to be like Jesus? Jesus was a singer. In the Gospel of Matthew, after the Last Supper, before they went out to the Mount of Olives, the Bible says that they sang a hymn. Did you know God the Father is a singer? The Bible records the song of God the Father. In Zephaniah 3, verse 17, the prophet said, The Lord your God is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over you with joy and joy over you with singing. This is an imperative practice from our God. There is indeed reference to singing in the book of Genesis, but the first actual singing uh, occurs in the book of Exodus, and it continues all the way through the eternal state in the book of the Revelation. Your Bible is, among other things, a book about singing in worship to God. And there was great singing at the dedication of the walls around Jerusalem. It is an imperative practice. There's a second truth I want you to notice about this mandate. That is, it is an important priority. Now, this doesn't have as much to do with singing as it does with the priority of worship. But in our busy culture, where we've got so much going on, vying for our time and for our attention, I can't overlook the important priority of worship that is reflected in this text. Because before they return to their, their lives and the routine, the, the mundane day in and day out, they stop to prioritize the worship of God. If you've been with us in this study, you know what's been happening. They, the, Nehemiah came back. They rebuilt the walls in a period of 52 days. And after that, they had a worship service in chapter 8. The power of God fell under the preaching of God's Word. They were broken in repentance before God. In chapter 9 and chapter 10, and they began to confess their sins to God. In chapter 10, uh, they, they, they wrote a letter of recommitment to God. They put it in an envelope in chapter 11. They said, before y'all go back, we've got to decide who's going to live here in the city of Jerusalem and serve God by, by attending to the things of the temple. And now all of that has been done. But listen to me. Before they get back to the routine of their lives, things that are calling for their time and attention, they say nothing is more important than being here with the people of God to worship Him and to thank Him for what He has done. 
Now, if you know the historical context, there were houses that needed to be rebuilt. But that did not take priority over worshiping God. It was early fall. The Feast of Booths and Tabernacles had just ended. There was the the late summer and the early fall harvest to bring in, but that did not take priority over the corporate worship of God. They had been away from their homes for many weeks because of the revival and the Feast of Booths and Tabernacles that followed it and all of the things we've just reflected on, but none of that took priority over worshiping God. Ma'am, there were dishes to get home to wash, clothes that needed to be cleaned, but that did not take priority over worshiping God. Perhaps the Jerusalem Soccer League was about to kick off its travel ball season, but that did not take priority over worshiping God. The Benjamites and the Danites may have been playing at 6 o'clock kickoff on on the JSN, the Jerusalem Sports Network. But that did not take priority over the worship of God. Now, lean in close and listen. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that should have greater priority in our lives than gathering together and worshiping the Lord with the people of God. Now, one of the things that I have seen across the body of Christ, I'm not talking about Emmanuel, although we're not exempt. One of the things that I have seen is that a global pandemic has revealed some things about the priorities of God's people. It has really just given some people a better sounding culturally acceptable excuse to not gather together with God's people. Now, if I'm not describing you, just pass it on, uh, anoint it, ordain it, bless it, and pass it on to somebody else. But you do realize that when people say, well, I just don't, I don't need to be in a crowd right now, you do realize we see you on Facebook, don't you? What'd you say? I didn't hear you. You're not afraid of a crowd. Many of God's people seem to be afraid of a church crowd. Next week, we begin a Sunday night revival series, and we're going to be studying the Word of God, and we're going to be coming together to sing. And I just want to ask, will that be a priority for you? Your children go to school, they ride the bus, they, 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 they're, they're, they're in sports activities, they sit together with all these things. Are you afraid that, that they're going to catch something in Sunday school that they won't catch in the first grade class at Midway? Don't you get quiet on me, I'll preach till lunch is passed. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Now, if you're sick, you live with somebody that's immune compromised, or if you're immune compromised yourself, again, I'm not talking to you. I'm just asking, will the things of God be a renewed priority for you? Now, one reason that I know what I'm talking about, because I'm talking to us. You give the preacher five or six Sunday nights off where he doesn't have to get a sermon together, and I can find my schedule getting filled in with other stuff, including just a little bit longer Sunday afternoon nap. You know, our our schedules don't stay still. They don't stay static. It's like when you pull your hand out of a bucket of water, the thing fills in with something. And when you take Sunday school out of the mix, hey, Sunday school teacher, when you take that 5 o'clock teacher's meeting out of the mix, you didn't just suddenly get an extra hour to sleep. It, It filled in with something. And if you just try to cram Sunday school teaching back into it, choir member, if you just try to cram choir practice back into a schedule that's filled in with other stuff, you're going to think you don't have enough time. What I want to ask you to do is what God's challenging me to do. Study our life, study our schedule, study our priorities, and ask, what other things have I allowed to infiltrate my schedule when when, when corporate worship and Sunday school and stuff got shut down? And that's the stuff that needs to be moved back out of the way so that I can prioritize the things of God. It had been decades since these Jews had worshipped in the way that they're worshipping here. They had some old habits to break. I simply want to ask you today, when it comes to worshipping God with His people, I used to say that the question is not, do you have a voice, but do you have a song? That's not a bad little turn of a phrase. But if you understand the Bible, it really doesn't matter whether or not you've got a voice or a song. You've got a command. And the command for God's people ought to be enough. It's it's the mandate for our singing. 
Second truth I want you to note is the manner of our singing. Years ago, when I was a minister of music, we were in the midst of what then Brother Andrew was called the worship wars. And a lot of that argument, not all of it, but a lot of it was about musical style. Are you going to do the new stuff or the old stuff? We use piano and organ or maybe, maybe a band like we have in our services. I learned a long time ago as a staff member and a pastor, you're not going to please people by catering to their musical preferences. But that does not mean that we should not be concerned about the manner of our worship. Our worship should be guided by and governed by the Word of God. In theological terms, it's called the regulative principle of worship. That just simply means that the Bible should regulate all that we do. So as we look in this section of Nehemiah 12, how does the Bible generally, and this text specifically, describe congregational worship? Well, first of all, there's a word about how expressive it was. Now, this text goes to some length to describe the procession. I I didn't read all the uh, minute details of it, but they divide the people into what the text calls two great choirs. The walls around Jerusalem were huge. They were wide and they were vast. How wide? Well, wide enough for two choirs to get up on top of it. And basically, he said, we're going to dedicate these walls. One choir get up right here and you walk around the city one way. The other choir, I want you to get on the wall and march around the city walls the other way. They're playing instruments. They're singing songs and hymns of praise to God. We're going to meet back up in the middle, and we're going to process to the temple of God. And the Bible says that what was happening there was so loud that people who were not part of the service heard it from what the text just simply says, far away. How far away is far away? I don't know, but it was loud enough that you could feel it in your bones. It was, you you could see it with your eyes. You could hear it with your ears. It was an expressive worship service. And we know that all true worship begins in the heart. Jesus said in John chapter 4 that God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship, if it's true worship, must start in the heart. Isaiah prophesied and Jesus quoted that the, that the people of Christ's day worshipped Him with their lips, but their hearts were far from Him. So I want you to know, I'm not advocating today pharisaical worship where you just go through the motions, but your heart is not engaged. What I am suggesting is that when the heart is engaged, worship that starts in the heart doesn't stay in the heart alone. It shows up on the face You say, well, I'm not a singer. Well, could you look like you don't need a worming? That old old children's song, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. We used to sing, if you're happy and you know it, tell your face. (laughs) Worship that starts in the heart. Doesn't stay in the heart alone. It shows up. It shows up on the face. It it shows up at times in the hands. It might show up in the feet, which which is a, a, a biblical picture of conduct of the life that we live, the things we do and, and refuse to do. And certainly it shows up in the mouth. This was expressive worship. Years ago, a member of our church came and told me about a conversation they had with a coworker. That co-worker was coming to visit our church, I think for a baptism or something like that. And the co-worker said to our church member, look at me, look at me. I'm practicing, getting ready to go to church at Emmanuel. And our member looked at their friend and said, look at me, look at me. I'm practicing going to church with you. (laughs) Now we want to be cautious in our worship that it's, that it's God that gets us excited. One of the challenges that every musical style has is that songs have an ebb and a flow. They, they, have, a, they, have, a, they have a tension. They, they have a, a building up to a climactic point. And we want to make sure that, that, that when we're clapping and when we're shouting, it's not because we're at that section where the drums have really built up and we, we have the same kind of response that you would have at an old Conway Twitty concert. But are we responding to the truth that is being declared? 
And for people who are in tune with what the Spirit of God is doing, I I mean, if you're Spirit-filled, that means controlled by the Spirit. Do you know the number one thing that the Holy Spirit of God wants to do? He wants to point to and exalt and lift up Jesus Christ. And if that's happening around you and you're in tune with the Spirit inside you, the Spirit inside you is going to say you need to do something to take part in what's going on in the glorious exaltation of Jesus Christ. In some way, it's going to be outwardly and externally expressed. Notice this verse on the screen, Psalm 33 verse 1 says, Sing for joy in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming. Would you say the word becoming? Praise is becoming to the upright. Now the word becoming speaks of two things that fit together. We will even sometimes use that word in our vernacular. That dress is very becoming. That new haircut is very becoming. We mean that it, it kind of fits your face, it fits uh, your figure, it, 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 it accentuates, it looks good. The, the two things fit and they look right together. The, the, the Bible says God looks down and says that praise is becoming to the upright. That is, if you've been made upright, how do you get made upright? How do you become one of the righteous ones? You repent of your sin and you understand that God's Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for your sin, bodily rose from the dead. When you repented, He washed your sins away, forgave you, and reconciled you to God. And the question is, does your external worship fit somebody who claims that that happened to them? If we were to make a video of your participation in the congregational service earlier and just showed it to someone and asked them, does that look like somebody who was on their way to hell and they had their sins forgiven and now they're on their way to heaven and the song is about the person that saved them from hell and is taking them to heaven? Does, does, does your worship fit that testimony? Is praise becoming to the upright? That word becoming is used in Psalms and Proverbs and, and in the Song of Solomon. And in the Song of Solomon, there, there the groom is describing how his, how his bride looks when she has prepared herself for marital intimacy. And I don't have to be any more suggestive than that. And then, then the way Solomon looks at his wife who has, who has done the best she can with her physical body to present herself lovingly to her husband... And the, and the groom says that my, my wife is be, she's, she's becoming, she, she, she is beautiful in the way that she has presented herself. That's the word that the Holy Spirit uses to say what God says when He sees His bride presenting themselves in worship before Him. That God the Father says, I am well pleased with what I see. How expressive it was. Another thing I want you to notice in this text, how excellent it was. Now, now in verses 44 through 47, we, we won't take the time to reread them, but we, we see the record of how people brought tithes and offerings to the house of God to help sustain, Brother Andrew, you'll like this, to help sustain and provide the salary for the full-time worship leaders at the house of God. By the way, um, this past week was the four-year anniversary of God bringing the fountains to our church staff, uh, where Brother Andrew serving as minister of music. And uh, we've hired such wonderful staff, it's hard for me to say one of the, that it's the best hire that I've ever made, but it's certainly one of the best, and God has richly blessed us through your ministry. How excellent. But there was a group that was set aside to train and study and prepare themselves to lead the worship. Why? Because God deserves the very best we have to offer Him. The psalmist said that we should play skillfully and shout for joy. For some to play and sing skillfully, we need you to go sing on a hill far away. (laughs) Or perhaps to go sing in the garden alone, (laughs) right? No, in this context, of course, skillfully just means to give God the very best that you can. And if you're not a soloist, you don't have to be a soloist because man looks on the outward appearance. Man listens to the outward audible, but God looks at the heart. And to give the very best song and the very best worship that you have 
to the Lord. But, but here we see that they wanted their worship to be excellent, the very best that it could possibly be. That's why really among the most faithful members we have of our church are the instrumentalists who have led us in worship. They come many hours a week, sometimes the, the, the first people to get here and some of the last people to leave. Why? Because, they, because they're, they're, they're 40-year-old guys who, who want to play in a rock band and they're trying to relive their youth. No, because they love Jesus. And they want to worship Him with their instruments and they want to be used by God to lead others in an excellent way. As we hopefully start wrapping up this COVID shutdown, I, I think I would be remiss right here to not say how grateful we are for the excellent giftedness we have in our technological ministry. The, those who, who run the sound and who run the lights. And I'm telling you, when, when, when COVID hit, we were just like every other church in America going around to find out, how do you go on Facebook Live? Is YouTube the best way to do that? The hours and hours and the thousands of dollars and, 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 the, and, and all of the expertise that needed to be, be spoken into that moment, all under Brother Stacy Wells' leadership. We owe them a great debt of gratitude for how they have, they have served us and helped us serve Jesus with excellence in the area of worship. If you were here, you know, last week in the second service, I think it was, there was a little glitch uh, with, with, a, with a choir track. And one reason that stood out is because that's so rare. And it wasn't even anybody's fault. It was a computer glitch. But you go to some churches, and it's just like that every single service, and they don't care. Bad music and bad singing and ill-prepared, flippant, casual worship does not bother them. It ought to bother us because I believe it bothers God. Our worship should be as excellent musically as it can possibly be. There's the mandate of our singing, the manner of our singing, thirdly and quickly, the message from our singing. What, what message should be proclaimed through the musical portion of our worship service? For most of my life in ministry, I've heard and I've even said that music in a service prepares the hearts of the congregation for the preaching of God's Word. Now, I believe there is a sense in which that is true, but the sense in which that is true is the wrong sense. The sense in which that is true is a false sense because the, the, the music should not be a preparation for the declaration of the gospel. The music shouldn't be a preparation for the proclamation of Bible truth. The music should be a declaration of Bible truth itself. I understand. When we say it prepares the heart, what we really mean is it gives us 20 or 25 minutes to get all the junk out. We've been fighting with the kids and fussing with our spouse and distracted by all this kind of stuff, and it helps us get focused. I want to ask you a question. The God who created you out of the dust of the earth invites you to His house to speak to you, and you need 20 minutes of music to determine that you want to stop and listen to what He wants to say? No, we ought to walk in the door on go saying, God, I've come to worship you. I want to hear from you. I want to hear Bible truth. And if the music isn't dripping with the blood of Calvary and infused with the power of the resurrected Christ, we ought to say, Brother Andrew, you didn't get it done today. What kind of message ought there to be in our singing? Well, first of all, I've just alluded to this. The lyrics should be explicit. Everything that we do in congregational worship ought to be crystal clear. We've come to worship the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and to revel in the fact that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and by nothing but His own good grace and mercy, He saved us and forgave us and caused us to be born again. That truth ought to, ought to be proclaimed from the very first note to the final amen in the service. Whether it's in baptism or prayer or announcements, the receiving of the offering. You've, if you've been listening, you've heard me say perhaps hundreds of times that the offering is a picture of the gospel. The only thing we have to give to God is something that He first gave to us. And it's a picture of the fact that we can love Him because He first loved us, and we can come to Him only because He first came to us. All that is pictured when you drop an offering envelope in one of those boxes. When you click the Give Now 
a, a tab on the online giving. You're just saying, you ought to be saying, God, I'm giving to you because you've given so much to me. Thank you for the cross. All of this ought to be crystal clear and explicit. I don't know if you were really paying attention to some of the words you sang earlier in the service. I know one of the dangers of, by the time you start learning a song in the congregation, really knows that there are some people that already are so familiar with that song. Let's be honest, we can sing it on autopilot. The only thing that could be potentially wrong with the song Amazing Grace, perhaps one of the greatest songs of all time, is that when we sing it, we're often not amazed by His grace because we've sung it so much. And that's the beauty of treating songs differently so that the music can call our attention more clearly to the, to the lyrics. But did you notice what you sang a few moments ago? Listen to it carefully. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace that the God of ages stepped down from glory to bear my sin and wear my shame? The cross has spoken. What did it say? I am forgiven. The king of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. Were you paying attention when you sang, Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. If you come back tonight at 6 o'clock, and oh, how I hope you do, who would not want to come and stand with the people of God and sing a new song we're presenting again tonight that says, Jesus, your mercy is all my plea. I have no defense. My guilt runs too deep. The best of my work pierced your hands and your feet. Jesus, your mercy is all my plea. So I'll praise the King who bore my sin, took my place when I stood condemned. Oh, how good you've always been to me. I will sing of your mercy. Many songs presented in many churches today are so vague, so nebulous, so fuzzy that you could almost sing them at the annual gathering of the ACLU. You could sing them in any religious service to any supposed deity. But I think there ought to be absolutely explicitly clear. We're singing about the God of eternity past who robed himself in flesh and blood, came and lived on this earth, died as a substitutional sacrifice in our place, rose from the dead, and will grant forgiveness and repentance to any and all who will believe. I can't preach that message without stopping to ask you, have you embraced that Bible truth? We've we've been singing about it from the very first song this morning. Have you been saved? If you have been saved, you ought to be a singer The old hymn writer said, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. The lyrics should be explicit. But we also see in this text, finally, the Lord should be exalted. Verse 45 says, they perform their worship of God. Verse 46 says, they sang songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. They came and they said, God, in light of everything you've done for us, individually, for our family, and as a people, this is for you. I have a confession to make. As a musician myself, former music minister, and the leader of this church, I want you to come and enjoy the music and like the service. Fair to say, Brother Andrew, I mean, you have a guest who comes and you tell their first time uh, family, it, it, it blesses you if you see them clapping and singing. You can tell that they are engaged in the worship and we would say commonly that they, they, that they like the service. I'd rather them like the service than not like the service. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if you like it or I like it or not. 
doesn't matter if you like to sing or I like to sing or if we don't like to sing. What matters is what does Jesus want? So in just a couple of minutes, literally, Brother Andrew's going to come and we're going to sing a song of invitation. And if, you, if you've not engaged, you've got one more shot to do it this morning, then be back tonight at 6. We're going to do it all over again. And it'd be a great opportunity to come together and say, Lord Jesus, after all you've done for me, how can I keep from singing? You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.